This actually happened to me a few months ago when I went to a small cookout. It was going to be me, my girlfriend Angie, my sister and her husband at my parents' house, and possibly a few of their friends or neighbors. My parents don't live in the best neighborhood, but they make do with what they have. They do have one of the nicer houses on the block though, surrounded by some pretty trusting neighbors that are a bit younger than them, so I at least felt comfortable knowing they were safe where they were. Angie was kind enough to make potato salad to bring because I fail at cooking almost anything, and I brought soda. Once we got there, I was greeted by my mom in the kitchen, finishing up her cake she always made. It's like a vanilla bean cake with strawberry and blueberry puree mixed in. It is one of the best cakes I've ever had. She also made grilled corn on the cob and baked potatoes, while my dad made the brats, hamburgers, and chicken, since my sister didn't eat red meats. Just laying out our spread for dinner as it will be relevant for later. Shortly after us, my sister showed up with little snack foods like crackers, cheese, chips, and dip. We were all sitting around talking when I realized I hadn't brought out the soda. They had been sitting in the kitchen behind some other items. I went to grab them. My dad mentioned putting them in a cooler and that way we could get them cold, or at least cooler than it was outside in this heat. As I went to get the cooler and pull some ice out of the deep freeze, I noticed they didn't have any. My parents love ice for some reason, and they always had like a huge bag of it, so it was weird to see it empty. When I went to ask them about it, they said their deep freeze had actually quit working, so they had to move what they could to their freezer and tried to save the rest in their little cooler, which included their ice. They had just got it fixed the day before and apparently forgot to go get more. I offered to go get some more since I didn't think about it anyway and off my girlfriend and I went for ice. We went to the store that was maybe three miles or so away. It was one of the nicer ones in the area with usually a lot of people around. That also meant there were more sitting outside of the front, asking for money, cigarettes, gas, etc. Nothing new to me, however, as we approached the store, there was a woman sitting nearby with a sign that just said, stay safe. She was wearing a mask and sunglasses, she had her hair in a messy bun, and was dressed like she just came from church. At first glance, you'd think it was someone doing the normal, but she wasn't asking for anything. She was singing. I couldn't tell you the song, but it sounded gospel-like. As people walked by, she waved at them or nodded. A bit different to say the least, but not the strangest thing I've seen. As we approached the entrance, though, I noticed she stopped singing and pulled her sunglasses up and just stared at us. From the moment we got to the sidewalk and walked in, she stared. Like she recognized us, maybe, but couldn't remember who we were. Once it finally registered she was staring at me, I just smiled and tried my best not to make eye contact. But you know that feeling when there's eyes on the back of your head, I knew she was watching me still. I made a hard dash around the corner once in the store and turned to Angie to ask if she had witnessed that too and she laughed. She obviously saw it too but just joked that she was probably trying to intimidate me, maybe because she had never seen me before. I remember half ass agreeing with her because why else was she doing that and why me? From there we grabbed the ice, paid and headed back out. The entrance and exit doors are one so this means I had to walk past crazy again. So out we go and not really thinking I needed to be on guard though, just that I would be stared at. My arm suddenly is grabbed by none other than this lady. I look over real quick to once again see her lift her glasses and pull down her mask and all she says is, don't eat the peppers. She has the most serious and concerned look on her face and I stayed like that for a few seconds. Believe me, it felt a hell of a lot longer but then she let go of my arm, slowly pulled her mask back up and started singing again. 
I walked a little faster to my car while I kept looking back at her. Once again, in the car, I asked if Angie saw that. She again agreed it was weird, but chalked it up to just her being crazy. I thought I was overreacting, but for some reason, the way she looked at me just freaked me out, like she saw something in me. It was weird. Back at my parents' house, we filled up the cooler and Angie teased about the lady at the store. To my surprise though, my parents were not surprised by this. She said she's always up there, and if she's not singing, she'd stop random people at the doors and say something weird to them, but said that they had never been stopped before. They also agreed, though, to not worry about it, and as it was probably more of the norm that they see. From then, we had a great night. A few of the neighbors came over and then left after drinking too much. All of the food was great, and the soda was cold. After people started leaving, me and Angie were the last ones to leave, as we typically are. As we were talking, we got on the subject of produce since my girlfriend was attempting a small vegetable garden on our apartment balcony. My mom remembered that she had bought some banana peppers from a local farmer's market and she thought they would be sweeter, but they were too spicy. They both hate spicy food, so they offered to give them to us saying we could use the seeds to plant. We didn't hesitate. I don't have a problem with spicy foods, but I also don't specifically seek them out either. We gathered our take-home stuff and headed out. Once we were home and putting stuff away, Angie wanted to try the peppers, so she pulled one out and took a bite of it. She said it was actually sweeter than usual and offered it to me, so I took a bite as well. It tasted as expected, again not being huge on spice, so I just agreed with her. It was only about 9 when we left and we were both off the next day, so we stayed up to watch a movie. Not too far into the movie, I started getting a really bad dry mouth and found myself constantly clearing my throat. I felt bad because I got up several times to get more water and had this coughing fit, but she seemed more concerned about me as it just started happening out of nowhere. That's when it started getting harder to breathe. You can guess where this is going. I was having an allergic reaction, and the only thing I ate recently were those damn peppers. Angie got me to the hospital quickly, and they gave me a really strong allergy med, basically, and waited to make sure the swelling in my face went down. It didn't dawn on us until after I got back home that that lady specifically told me not to eat the peppers. How would she have known any of that? My parents weren't with me, my mom didn't buy them from there, and they also weren't even part of dinner. I've also never had an issue with peppers before. I know it's stupid, but I've even tested this since by trying a few other peppers like jalapenos and poblanos and no reaction. I'm afraid to try another banana pepper again to see if it's now a permanent thing, or just that one-off time. Another thing I am confused about is, I don't know if I'm scared of that woman, or impressed. I used to sell a lot of stuff on Craigslist. It was really the only place to go to sell stuff at the time, other than a yard sale. I suppose after some time, I got too comfortable with it and let my guard down some as well. I am a female, weighing about 180 and about 5'5 at the time, so not small, but not out of shape, and I'd like to think I could handle myself if I was in danger. I guess that adds to me letting my guard down though. When I do sell stuff, I always do it in a public place, typically in a store like a coffee shop, bank parking lot because there are typically lots of security, or anywhere really with a large group of people. My ex had been living with me for a good part of a year before we split up. I told him he had a week to get all of his crap out while I was on vacation. I had a guy friend that was going to be going over there to feed my cat while I was gone so I was confident he wouldn't do anything stupid or take any of my stuff. 
It wasn't an easy breakup. He cheated on me. We tried to make it work afterwards, but it wasn't the same, so he wasn't disrespectful or anything, thankfully. But I guess you just never really know a person. Obviously, right? After I got back, I noticed there were still some random things he left there, like his toothbrush, some of his clothes that he left in the dryer, and his crappy old Xbox that didn't work anymore. He kept saying he was going to fix it, even though he didn't know squat about electronics. Conveniently though, he took all the games and controllers for it and literally just left the unit and the giant power cable. So I text him asking if he wanted the stuff he left, giving him one last chance. He didn't respond, so I tried two more times and I got an unpleasant response from his new girl, as she claimed, and decided then it was my stuff to do as I want with it. So I thought I would try to get a little money out of it. He had a couple sports jerseys he left and a nice pair of shoes that went pretty fast and then the Xbox. I did specify it was only the console itself in that it didn't work, so people didn't think I was getting away with some scam. I thought maybe someone out there could actually fix it or use the parts. I didn't know a thing about the stuff either, so I just listed it for $50. It didn't take long for me to get responses for it. Some people, of course, trying to get me to give it to them for free since it didn't work. Others more concerned about finding out if I was female and asking personal things about me. I did have one guy that didn't come off weird and seemed pretty straightforward with his questions. He asked if I knew what was wrong with it, why I wanted to sell it instead of fixing it, things like that. He even asked me to try doing something with it and tell him what lights came on, so I obliged. After all this, he then asked where to meet, what day and time. We were going to meet up at a park near this church that was about 20 minutes from my home, but pretty close to my work. The next day, I texted the guy to confirm he was still interested, and he confirmed. I then headed to the park, found a bench, and sat on it with the console in a bag next to me, waiting for the guy to show up. While I'm watching a couple of kids playing on the swings, I see a guy pull up, get out with no kids or dogs with him, and come look around the park like he was looking for something. I asked if he was Scott, and he smiled and confirmed he was. I confirmed who I was and motioned to the bag. He was in like a mechanic's jumpsuit and was trying to wipe his hands off to shake mine. I wasn't bothered by it and mentioned it as well. I pulled out the console and explained it was just that and the power cable, and he reached for his wallet and pulled out cash. He started sorting out the bill and waved a 20 at me, asking if I had change. I will say one thing about cash sales like this. If you agree on a price with someone, make sure you bring the right amount and have the ability to break it yourself because so many times I had people do this to me hoping I would just take the lesser amount and they get a discount. And it's rude, at least in my opinion. I will take my item back home and try with someone else instead of getting ripped off. Anyways, I told him I didn't and he gave me 60 instead, saying it was his fault after all. After asking several times if he was sure, he confirmed and I said thank you and started putting it back in my pocket. That's when things started getting weird. He asked me if I was here alone, and I confirmed this, but as I was trying to make a comment about being in a public place, he chuckled a bit and shook his head. I got a little annoyed by this and just stared at him. He said I should be more careful meeting up with strangers because you never know what their intentions are, and said since I was so pretty, I could easily be targeted. I made some kind of comment about how he just completely flipped this experience and that I can take care of myself. I started to get up to leave when he grabbed me by my wrists and said, See, I could have already had you subdued and in my car. He had such an evil smile on his face, and right before I was going to shake my arm free, he let go of me. I called him a name, loudly enough that a few parents turned around and looked at us as I left. 
I watched in my mirror as he slowly got up from the bench and waved at me, smiling. Why the hell would you say something like that? It's not helpful, and I don't see how anyone would have found it to be. Thankfully, I never saw him again, but it didn't stop him from texting me a few times, asking if I wanted to meet up for some coffee or lunch. I politely told him to shove off and blocked his number. So I guess that's just to say, be careful out there with who you do business with. Not everyone has the best intentions in mind. Hi, my name is Cynthia. My friends call me Cindy. I will not use my last name or the city I live in for privacy reasons. I have long white blonde hair with big ocean blue eyes with a voluptuously curvy figure that still makes men's heads turn and smile at me when I walk by on the street. By the way, I am 60 years old in 2023 and I am also a grandmother and nurse but please let me share with you a horrifying experience from my past that I was lucky to get out of. It was summertime, 1975, and I was 12 years old, playing on my swing set in my backyard when I heard the all too familiar ice cream truck chimes going up my long street. I immediately had a smile on my face as I got off my swing and rushed inside my house to get the money I needed from my small safe. My favorite ice cream was chocolate, and I wanted to pay for a chocolate ice cream cone. When I got outside, the ice cream truck had already passed by my house, but he heard my screams to please wait as he then stopped his truck. When the truck stopped, I soon saw the ice cream man was an elderly, thin man wearing a white, good humor ice cream hat in a white uniform. This was a different man altogether from the usual man who came to my street. I felt a little chill that something was not right, but it quickly passed when the thin-faced elderly ice cream man looked at me smiling and asked what ice cream I wanted. Chocolate ice cream, please, I said smiling broadly to him. I could not wait to get this ice cream in my mouth because it was a very hot summer day and the taste of it would be so yummy, I thought to myself. I was wearing my blue summer dress and black Mary Jane shoes on my feet. The ice cream man then looked me up and down. His stare made me very nervous. Wow, you're a pretty little girl and very well developed for your age too. What is your name, honey? He asked, still leering at me as he then took his bright bony hand and ran his skinny long fingers through my long lush blonde head of hair which I did not like because he did not ask permission to do so, and this was a stranger. I also noticed while he was running his hand through my hair, he was beginning to breathe harder and harder like he was getting excited doing this, turned on if you will. But before I could object, the elderly ice cream man said to me, come on inside the truck and look at the yummy treats up close so you could better decide. And by the way, my name's Mr. Keebler. I realize at my age now that this was wrong, but as a little girl, I was not thinking about stranger danger as much as kids today. Even though in the early 1970s, serial killer Dean Coral was killing young boys and men and other child killers were on the loose too. But the 1970s was a time where you could be away from home almost all day and your mom would not be calling everybody on the phone where you were, and hitchhiking was much more common in those days too. So, against my better judgment, I took this strange ice cream man's hand and entered his ice cream truck. I'm Cindy, by the way, I said finally giving him my name. The elderly ice cream man just smiled as his heavy, excited breathing got heavier. The ice cream treats looked amazing, there was vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry ice cream with different color popsicles, chocolate eclairs, vanilla ice cream bars covered with chocolate coating. I still wanted my chocolate cone though, and just when I turned to say something to the elderly ice cream man, he was behind of the wheel of his truck and took off down the road with me inside it. Instead of screaming, I just said to him, 
Sir, where are you taking me? The ice cream man said nothing, but I could hear and see his maniac laughing face through the driver's shield. The ice cream truck quickly pulled into a long, dark alley and stopped. The elderly Mr. Keebler then faced me, saying, Now, I let you in my ice cream truck to view the ice cream up close. I need you to do me a favor now, dear, he said sternly. I was not stupid. I knew I was in a heap of trouble with a pedophile and possibly a killer, too. I was just about to scream as he covered my mouth with his big hand. But just when he did, I heard a loud police car siren behind the truck. A young policeman quickly got out and ordered at gunpoint for Mr. Keebler to step out of the vehicle as he handcuffed him and read him his rights. Turns out that the neighborhood watch lady, Mrs. Simmons, saw my plight and called the police on Mr. Keebler, saving my life. Which I, of course, was grateful and thanked her for this. But I do wonder and worry how many children were not as fortunate as I am. I was allowed to grow up and have a full life. I was a lucky girl indeed. This story takes place a few years back when myself, my sister, and her two kids were all driving to a surprise birthday party for my older brother, Matt. It was a bit of a drive, and we were actually going to be on the road for probably 10 hours heading east, but the drive was worth it because it was his first birthday back after having been deployed overseas, and he'd only been home for around a month. Basically, we knew it was going to be a pain in the ass to get all the way out to our parents' house, but it was 100% worth it to see Matt, since it had been somewhere close to a year since we last saw him, and it seemed like he should be able to celebrate his birthday with the whole family. Like I said, the drive out east was going to take around 10 hours, my sister and I were both adults, and my nieces were around 4 and 7. My sister drove for the first half, and I said I would take the second half, as I knew that at five hours in, she would likely be in the back seat, keeping the little ones calm and collected. Four and seven are old enough to enjoy these kinds of car rides, but definitely not old enough to sit for ten hours straight, and I honestly don't blame them. If it weren't for Matt, I wouldn't have sat through this trip myself. We got through my sister's half without issue, and by the time I was getting behind the wheel, it was starting to get dark out. My sister sat in the back with the nieces, and somewhere around an hour or two into my half, she ended up falling asleep. The younger of my two nieces also fell asleep, but the older one, Courtney, was wide awake and watching all the things we were driving past. And while it may not sound like a thrilling adventure to drive with two people sleeping in the back seat and having random passing conversations with a seven-year-old, I thought it was fun. We were about an hour away from my parents' house when the actual event happened. And that's honestly what I have to call it, an event, mostly because I honestly don't know what actually happened. So. As stated, my sister and the youngest were sound asleep, and we were about 9 hours into our 10 hour drive. I was watching the highway and my speed, and just basically having a nonsense conversation with my niece. I think it was about some cartoon that she was really into at the time. As I'm watching the highway for the most part, every once in a while I glance up at the mirror and look at her. This is actually when the whole thing happened. I looked up in the mirror and said something to her. Then I glance back down and I see what I can only explain as an absolutely blinding white light. As soon as my eyes hit forward, I saw this seriously bright and all-encompassing flash of white. My first thought was that it was an oncoming car or something like that, but I just remember that immense and horrible sense of panic flooding through my body. What was weird, whatever it was, I never hit it. I thought we were going to smash into it, and I remember screaming. Hell, I even recall hearing my niece screaming, but it apparently never happened. 
it kind of felt like whatever that moment in time, when I saw that light, it kind of hung there for a moment and then reset back to me on the road, driving like normal. I didn't swerve. I didn't slam my brakes. I apparently didn't scream because the other two never woke up. I went from staring down an alarmingly bright light in front of me, going 70 down the highway, certain that I was on a collision course with whatever the hell it was, to driving like normal with nothing in front of me. Of course, that feeling of terror didn't pass. I was still running high on adrenaline when I came back to reality. I pulled the car over to the side of the road and tried to take deep breaths. When I stopped the car, my sister obviously woke up, asking if we were at the hotel yet. I told her no and that I just needed to take a moment to catch my breath. She asked if something happened, and before I could even respond, my niece starts telling her that we were talking about the cartoon, and then there was this really bright light in the middle of the road that randomly disappeared. Her vision was probably cuter and more detailed at the time. This actually made it worse though, because she confirmed what I saw. I saw all of this unfold, and she saw it too, which confirmed that I didn't fall asleep or have one of those micro nap things that you can have while driving. I legitimately saw this huge white light in the middle of the highway. Unfortunately, there was no way for me to explain the whole resetting thing, so I just left it at what she said. I told my sister that I wasn't sure what it was and that it just freaked me out a little bit. Nothing else happened the rest of the way. We all stayed awake and chatted for the last 40 minutes or so. We got there and had a great time. And while the party was certainly the highlight of the whole event, that was seriously a road trip that I'm not likely to forget anytime soon. I was excited when I heard about the internet mysterious side, which is known as the dark web. I listened to many dark web stories. They were creepy, but also unbelievable. It's just like a myth, but I don't know why, but I believed all dark web stories. To visit creepy and mysterious websites was my daily routine. Once me and my cousin decided to surf deep web, as it is not illegal, we opened deep web carefully by covering front camera of laptop and also by disabling microphone. We saw a lot of ambitions, drugs, chemicals, and the most dangerous thing was that there was a list of hitmen's. Everyone can make a contact with them. It was weird. Suddenly an ad popped up, nothing was written in it, and we clicked it. It was a red lighted room. I want to tell you that it wasn't a red room of dark web where people are tortured for bitcoins. It also wasn't a live chat. The red lighted room contained little dolls. They were weird because they were talking to each other. We closed that video and all the tabs. Maybe this video was a dark web video, I thought. This was 2 a.m. on a dark and cold night. After this day, I started to feel something bad and creepy. I always feel that someone is watching me. After some days of that incident, I was all alone in the home and I can easily see the second room of my house. I was reading a book and I saw a long black shadow-like creature watching me and when I focused on it, there was nothing. Again and again I feel someone is monitoring me. Once I was in the bathroom for my toothbrush, I heard the sound of that red lighted room, which I saw in the deep web video. The voice was coming from the window. The dolls were talking in that same unknown and creepy language. I got scared and got out. I sat in the room's chair and opened my book again. Suddenly from behind my chair, someone started to throw books. I looked back and there was no entity and I put the books back in their place. There is not only ghosts in our world, and I think there are many other creatures. God created many creatures. 
maybe these creepy dolls are another one. The video was really old, so I don't think that it was edited or was the result of AI technology either. So that, my friends, was another scary story collection. Just our grab bag of random stories, all of which still unsettling. And brought to you by the lovely people like you. So if you have a story that you'd like to send my way, you can submit that at mariesfield.com. It takes you straight to the page where you can submit the story, and I'd love to feature it. And if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like below. And if you'd like to hear more content like this, consider subscribing if you haven't already. And with that being said, friends, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. And until next time, take care.